My name is Karina Harney, Playboy's Playmate of the Year, 1992. And I'm Echo Johnson, Miss January, 1993. Welcome to the Bunny Chronicles. Let's go. Welcome back to the show. We've got a super special guest co-host today filling in for Karina for the next five five or six weeks. She'll be in here in the studio with me. Carrie, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience? Hi, I'm Carrie Yazel, Miss May 1991. Another one of the epic 90s girls. We've been told that decade was supreme, and I have to agree. <laughs> So we we have a great um, a great guest today. Very excited um, for Stephen to be on the show. Stephen Watts, and Stephen wrote Hugh Hefner's biography, Mister Playboy. So we are going to talk to Stephen about how all of that came to be and what that experience was like, and um, ultimately, you know, the takeaways from that. So. Stephen, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a little bit background. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. You got uh, it. I'm delighted uh, to talk to you guys. Um, I am a historian of American culture uh, at the University of Missouri. Oh, gosh, for the last 35 years or so, longer than I like to think about, actually. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess about 20 years ago, I... Uh, arranged uh, to do the biography of Hugh Hefner and spent quite a bit of time with him and out at the Playboy Mansion. And uh, I'll be happy to share any uh, stories or insights I might have about that with you. Yeah, absolutely. I know, I know there's a lot of them. So why don't you tell us, how did that even come to be? Uh, you reached out to uh, Hefner himself, or was it Playboy Corporate? How did that go down? Well, I... I reached out to them, and it's kind of an interesting story, at least from, from my angle. Um, I just finished a book on Henry Ford and was looking for a new project uh, about a cultural figure of uh, some import to write a biography of, and uh, Hefner sort of percolated to the top of my list. Nice. And I got <laughs> uh, the address of the Playboy Mansion and Dick Rosenzweig's name from an attorney friend of mine in Los Angeles. Uh, Rosenzweig was sort of uh, Hef's right-hand man on right. the business side of things. So I wrote a letter out of the blue to Rosenzweig and said, uh, you know, I'm Steve Watts. I'm a historian. I'm interested in writing a biography of Hugh Hefner. Uh, would he be interested in participating in this uh, to do some interviews? Uh, does he have sources that I can look at, et cetera, et cetera? And I sent this thing off expecting it would take weeks uh, for yeah. something to happen in response. And uh, to my utter shock, I sent the letter off, I think, on a Thursday or Friday. And the next Monday or Tuesday, I was chairman of the history department at that point. Uh, the secretary came in. She said, there's some guy on the phone here from the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> yeah, that happens every day, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. Totally normal. Yeah. Every professor. <laughs> so she gave me a strange look, and I kind of shook my head. <laughs> so I got on the phone, and <clears throat> it was Rosenzweig. And he said, well, Hef got your letter. I got your letter. We talked about it. And he said the short answer to this is that he would very much be interested in um, sort of cooperating in a, in a biography. And uh, we've sort of checked out your background and you seem like a pretty reputable guy. And so uh, actually Hef said, I've been waiting 30 years for somebody to contact me about doing a serious That's right. biography. That's right. So uh, wow. yeah, this was all music to my ears. So I said, great. Let's let's move ahead. And he said, well, why don't you come out and talk to us and you can talk to Hef about it. And I said, wonderful. When 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 can this happen? Again, thinking it would be weeks or a couple <laughs> months or something. And he said, well, how about this weekend? Wow. So, uh, I said, fine. So I got on the phone, got a flight. And no lie, I think it was eight days after I sent the letter to Hefner, I found myself sitting in the Playboy Mansion <laughs> in Holmby Hills, and Hef came bounding down the stairs to talk to me, and uh, the rest was history. So that's how that's how it happened. That's that's surreal. I mean, that's a really quick turnaround for them to um, to invite you. Number one, um, did I, I'm sure that there were other people that have had approached Hef about writing his biography, and and you definitely stood out. 
Well, I guess I'd like to think so. <laughs> um, what what uh, what I learned later was that there had been a number of uh, biographical projects that had uh, been in the works. Oh gosh, probably over the last twenty years. But I think all of them had been launched by Hef himself. Okay. And, um, he had uh, secured the services of writers or ghostwriters or what have you. And once I got into his materials, I saw that a great number of interviews had been done and work had been done by these other writers, but none of them ever seemed to come to fruition. So I think I was really the first outside person uh, to sort of get uh, into the mansion and to get Hefner's cooperation um, and, um, you know, was able to pull it off a few years later. Wow. Yeah, that, that's that's monumental. That's what, impressive. What an honor, though. I mean, mm -hmm. it, yeah. Uh, it was, it was uh, certainly one of the most interesting chapters of my life. Yes. You know, and something— same for us. Yeah, <laughs> same for us, exactly. <laughs> um, something you had mentioned in our preliminary interview that we did was that— um, that you had, um, had, the deal was that you maintain editorial rights completely. And that was a big deal. Carrie and I were talking about that because we all know that Hef was the consummate editor at the end of the day. That's really what his role was. People and control. Mm -hmm. he, he did not give up control. Not easily. at all. So not at all. That. Well, absolutely. And um, you put your finger on what was the first big issue. And um, when I got out there and had a, I spent the weekend, I guess this would have been in probably September of 2003, and I had a couple of long conversations with Hef, and, um, you know, the cooperation part was an uh, important part of the deal, but it was also important for me to have editorial control, and I was very upfront with him about that, you know, and I said, if we're going to do this... I really am going to insist that I have the final say what goes into this book. Right. And, you know, it's in your interest. It's in my interest. No one will take this book seriously if they think it's an inside job where you're just um, you know, having someone tell the story you want told. And I was expecting a bunch of blowback and a big sort of argument with him about this. And again, to my utter astonishment, I mean, I remember clearly we were sitting out on the back uh, patio behind the mansion. Mm -hmm. And I should say there were a bunch of people looking out the window <laughs> at us as we talked. What's um, going on down there? Yeah. How is this going to go? <laughs> <laughs> totally with binoculars. <laughs> so, yes, I said that and I was expecting, well, here we go. And again, to my utter astonishment, he said, Absolutely. He said, I, it is in my interest because wow. I don't think anyone yeah. will take the book seriously. So um, the sort of gentleman's agreement we reached was I would have editorial control over the book. When I finished a good draft, I would let him read it. Uh, if he had complaints, if he had things he thought I was wrong about or unfair about, I'd certainly listen, give, give a fair listen to what he had to say. But ultimately, it was my decision, and he agreed to that. And we shook hands, and everything was good after that. So. Well, that I have a question on just based on that note. Um, were there things that you found out uh, with research um, that Hef would have been okay with you writing that you chose to pull back from, given the fact that this is your profession, you know what you're doing, and you also know that the masses might have misunderstood a topic or a story, and you pull back. Well, sort of. Um, there were a number of things that have, well, he got, to be honest, he got mad at me a couple of times. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure <laughs> only a couple of times in those years. That's it. That's awesome. <laughs> well, yeah. When he actually saw it, you know, he thought that uh, I was sort of really unfair to him about a couple of things, and um, but I had the evidence backing me up, and so we had a, I won't say have heated conversation because we really got to be friends, and yeah, um, so almost colleagues in a way and so I mean I think there was a mutual respect there so it wasn't shouting or yelling that happened but uh, there were a couple of uh, uh, fairly severe disagreements about this and um, the one I'm thinking of in particular is uh, back in the 50s when Hef first got 
the magazine off the ground, uh, and he was talking about his vision of men in 1950s America and sort of the Playboy uh, philosophy and magazine. Uh, at that time in the 50s, he very much bounced all of that off of what he considered to be sort of um, a process of American men growing effeminate. Mm. And he thought there was, a, in the 50s, he talked about um, there being a kind of, uh, as they called it at the time, a lavender menace, uh, sort of the rise of homosexuality among men. And he thought this was something that was sort of taking men down the rabbit hole. And he juxtaposed Playboy. But, but you know, in 2004 or five, uh, by then, uh, he had changed his views quite a bit, as I think most Americans had, about homosexuality. And he sort of refused to believe that he had ever said such a thing <laughs> uh, in the 50s that, you know, he kind of got pissed off at me because how could, you know, are you calling me a homophobe and all of that? And I said, well, you know, God, don't have, but here's the evidence. Here's what you said. Here, here are the editorials. Here are the radio transcripts, blah, blah, blah. And he finally um, sort of toned down about that and I kind of toned down about it a little bit because I didn't want to paint him as a homophobe because that you know it really wasn't the case by the time he came around but that's the uh, an example of the kind of thing uh, we had to work through on occasion a diff complicated difficult issues that's that's super interesting and ultimately at the end of the day and you had said this as well that Hef thrived on the exchange of ideas and he definitely had a lot of respect for you. So it, I, I can only imagine that was a really interesting dynamic that, that you two had and created that evolved over a span of five years while you were writing this book. Yeah, it was uh, really interesting that way. And it's, I mean, really speaking personally, it's a kind of special memory for me because um, I've written about a lot of famous people, but all of them were dead, uh, except for Hefner, so I never really got to talk to them in person. And I ended up interviewing Hef, oh, I don't know, probably close to 50 hours wow. of uh, taped interviews and long, long sessions, and I learned very quickly that he was a pretty sharp cookie. And, um, <laughs> so there was a real kind of challenge uh, to uh, talk to this really intelligent person high achieving person who had had such an impact and really try to draw out of him certain things. And if I may too, Hef, <laughs> um, I also learned pretty quick that Hefner had done like a million interviews over right. the course of his career. And I thought I was getting stuff really special. And then I would read out of the interviews and he had said the same damn thing to like 15 different interviewers <laughs> over the years. Ah, did you call and, him out on so, that? <laughs> Well, it it was more subtle than that. What um, I decided is that I needed to do in these interviews, since I did more research into what he had said, was to try to knock him off his game a little uh. bit, uh, to ask questions that other people hadn't asked or to ask them in a different way or to ask them in such a way that he would know that I knew he'd already gave these pat <laughs> answers and I was looking That's for awesome. some. So it was a kind of, uh, kind of a sparring, verbal sparring session, if you will. <laughs> and really it was just a, t a ton of fun because he's a really smart guy. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed the interviews very much uh, in that, in that vein. Yeah. And I think ultimately, I mean, we've heard this from so many people and um, you know, we as playmates as well, and the time that we spent at the mansion, it was always one of our favorite things was to get the opportunity to sit and talk with Hef. It was always, yeah. you know, and he and he he was always very present and he wanted to listen and he wanted to understand yeah. and, he, you know, have dialogue. And that was a really beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah, it was. I think he did like to exchange views and talk. And um, I really relished those hours he spent in the library with that stupid tape recorder going between <laughs> us. And we'd both be sort of bent over it, you know, uh, going back and forth about all kinds of things. It was really uh, definitely a very interesting experience for me. So, so this was over a span of five years. So what was your impression when you first arrived at the mansion? Well, that's a good question. Um, when I started going out to the mansion, I got a ton of questions about that, of course, here back in the heart of the Midwest. And sure. 
Um, I always told people that for a Midwestern boy like me, especially one from a rural background, it was sort of like parachuting onto a different planet. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a good way to say it. I like it. Yeah. yeah, it's like, well, you, you, you guys know when you go to the mansion, it really is kind of a world in and of itself. And um, it sort of has its own rules and its own traditions and its own customs. And uh, there's a kind of social pecking order there and a social arrangement of things. And uh, as I learned over the months and eventually the years, it was a very, very interesting place, but it was something quite different from anything that I'd ever experienced. So at first it was quite alien to me, but as I got to... You know, as my as I parachuted in and explored the terrain a little bit <laughs> and kind of got a feel for what was going on, uh, you know, it got to be uh, just a different sort of reality I would go into sure. when I went out to um, Homeby Hills. And once I learned the rules and learned the lay of the land, it got to be a very natural kind of environment for me. So you then were, you were staying at the mansion when you were there. Obviously, you'd go back and forth between home and the mansion, but you were staying in the mansion. Right. Well, um, when I originally went out there and we agreed we'd get this book off the ground, um, you know, I talked to Hef and I said, well, you know, where can I stay around here? This is really expensive. (laughs) Beverly Hills and Hopi Hills, you know, I, I can't afford very much of this. And he said, well... All of my records are the third floor of the mansion. Mm -hmm. You're going to interview me here. You've told me that you want to see my life from the inside, which I had told him I was very interested in doing to add flavor and color to the book. He said, why don't you just come stay here? And um, uh, as a, well, the arrangement we made is that, um, you know, not to pay as if for a hotel. I ended up making a kind of big donation at the end of all of this to the Playboy Foundation mm. uh, as a kind of payment for my my uh, uh, staying there during the doing of this book. Um, originally, I stayed, he had uh, the mansion over across the road, mm. or excuse me, the house over across the road from the mansion uh, behind it from the back gate. And I would stay over there and then walk up the street and in the back gate every morning to do my work at the mansion. But then eventually things sort of shifted around and I ended up staying in the mansion itself up on the second floor. Even better. Uh, in one of the bed. bed. Yeah. So I was a lot closer to everything. Trust. And, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, the absolutely. closer you got, it makes sense that the closer you got yeah. <laughs> physically. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I really could get inside all of this and kind of write from the inside out, which was an interesting perspective as well. Were you overwhelmed with the amount of documents and paper, yeah. paper and scrapbooks? And I mean, it, it had to be like, you know, one of those court document, you know, those court shows where they bring in the, <laughs> the cases and cases of files just to put somebody off. <laughs> you, you had to... Yeah. Well, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's it, a, was a it lot. had to be a lot. I, I'm overwhelmed yeah. thinking about it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, it's just thinking back to how I got acclimated to all of this. Uh, you know, as a historian, I think I've, I guess I've written eight books now, and I've been in a lot of archives, and some of them have a little material and some a lot, and oftentimes you have to kind of hunt and scrape to get things. So I go out to Hefner's place and early conversations. And I said, well, Hef, you know, what kind of sources do you have here? Um, And he said, well, I've got this scrapbook. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, well, it's like this big scrapbook like most of us may no, have. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Right. Newspaper clipping stuffed in it and, you know, a few letters, this, that, the other, and uh, kind of a mess. And uh, I said, well, really, how, what's it like? And he said, well, why don't come with me and I'll show you. And so we wind our way up to the second floor, wind our way up those skinny little stairs up to the third floor. And he said, well, here's my scrapbook. And I was utterly confused at first because like <laughs> everywhere I looked, there were volume, leather bound volumes yeah. of books. And I said, well, which one? Where at? And he said, all of this is the scrapbook. And I remember I, um, sort of had to sit down and take a breath because I really couldn't believe it. <laughs> I, had, I think by the time I left, he had 800 volumes wow. of 
his scrapbook that dated back to his days, I think, in grade school when he had started. He was kind of a pack rat, Shocking. and he kept all of this stuff. And you, uh, I don't know if you know, but he had a couple of full-time people who did nothing but put yes. stories. And yeah, Steve Martinez, letters. actually. I was going to ask yeah, exactly. if you worked with him at all because yeah. he was in the archives. Yeah, that was his, yeah. Yeah, I kind of had the desk over from Steve. Yeah. But, so I found immediately I was drowning in stuff in a way that I could never have imagined. Yeah. So, yeah, I was really shocked to learn about it. And then he had file cabinets full of stuff, uh, company records and interview transcripts and letters and this, that, and the other. So, yeah, my problem was sorting through all of this stuff, not um, you know, digging it up to get a decent story. Right. Yeah, because every finite detail of Hef's life, and our audience may not know, that it did go all the way back to his childhood. He started scrapbooking at a very early age. And he actually holds the record, the Guinness Book of World Records, for <laughs> the ultimate scrapbooking <laughs> That's <laughs> <just> collection. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I can believe that's, it. That's shocking. Yeah, I mean, it was just amazing to see cartoons that he had done right. when he was like nine, nine years old. Or How something. cool. I read all of these scrapbooks. And yeah, that's tons a, of stuff like that. That's amazing. So you really were able to see the day-to-day... Um, you know, workings of not only the mansion, but of Huff's lifestyle. And so talk about that, because we obviously know that he... One side of it, yeah. Yeah, and, but that he was religious about how he operated, and there was a schedule, and he never, ever veered from that, you know, whether it was the movie night, manly night, whatever. So tell us about that. Yeah, well, uh, one of the things I learned quickly about Huff, as you just mentioned, was that he was a creature of habit. Yeah. Um, well, I'm a creature of habit, but I mean, he puts me in the shade very, very quickly. <laughs> There's levels. Uh, because, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's kind of at the, t- the top alpha level of that. Uh, as I learned at the mansion, everything sort of operated according to a schedule. And you would see it in the scrapbook itself where there was this kind of devotion to uh, getting every detail of his life sort of in black and white uh, in this scrapbook from his earliest days as a kid up to the very last days of his life. And some, I don't remember who it was, but somebody joked uh, who had seen the scrapbook that he was so obsessive about it that Hef was the only person he knew who was living his old life posthumous. <laughs> That's true. So, which is, uh, isn't that a great line? Mm-hmm. It's true. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, but, th- but then, as you probably know as well, the operation of the mansion itself, Hef did everything the same according to sort of days of the week. Yep. Uh, f- you know, Friday night would be movie night sort of for uh, old old movies uh, with uh, people in a buffet. Saturday night would be for slightly newer movies with people in a buffet. Sunday would be for new release movies with friends in a buffet. Monday night was manly night. Tuesday night was card night with his old buddies. Mm-hmm. Wednesday night, I think he saw his kids. Thursday night, or he spent, you know, he spent the evening with his boys. Thursday night, he went out with his girlfriends to right. a restaurant. You know, re- rinse and repeat over mm-hmm. and over and over. It never changed. He ate the same things uh, diet-wise, uh, according to the days of the week. And wow. he had seven or eight recipes that his mother had made that were sort of um, behind plastic in the kitchen. And he would have pork chops on Monday and meatloaf on Wednesday and fried chicken, you know, blah, blah, blah. The same sort of thing over and over and over. That's and really that's really cool. I didn't know that he had recipes from his mother. Mother. Like, I knew that he yeah. ate the same foods yeah. over and over, but that's, uh, I love because that. Because he, he, there's so many things that were traditional yeah. about Hef, and, and it's very yeah. hard for people to imagine what they yeah. know, and the reality is much bigger. He's much more layered. Yeah, much more layered. Yeah, one of the uh, chefs, when I was there, I uh, sort of asked him about this, and he took me back in the kitchen. <laughs> they literally had a, a little bound book, and I can't remember the title. It was like Hef's Recipes or Hef's Mother's Recipes or something. And he, he flipped it over, and they had put these recipes behind sheets of plastic. <laughs> and it was like meatloaf and fried chicken and pork chops and what have you. And you sort of flipped over, and there they were. That's the ones they followed. Oh, I love that. I love that. So tell us about um, about uh, Manly Night. That's um, 
that's interesting that you had access to that because again, it's been my understanding and just from talking to his his you know closest friends and confidants, there was a select group of men that would always be in that group. And so you were able to be a part of that consistently. Well, there was. When um, when I first got there, I heard about Manly Night and I sort of asked half about it. And um, he explained that on Monday nights, it was a gathering that had been going on, I think, since he moved out to the West Mansion in L.A., where he and his oldest male friends and his brother Keith um, would get together and they would have dinner and they would watch old movies, like usually movies from the 30s. Uh, sometimes uh, pre-code movies from the 1920s. Mm. And, um, you know, they would like smoke cigars and tell bad jokes and give each other grief. And, (laughs) you know, it was a kind of manly sort of thing. And I said, well, wow, that's really terrific. You know, could I sort of observe that sometime? That would be really a good way to look at part of your life. And he said, well, actually, why don't you just come and join in? We'd be delighted to have you. (laughs) So... I think the very first trip I made there, I showed up on Monday night. And again, I got the, who, who the hell is this guy? And <laughs> I'm sure. Introduced me. And yeah, from then on, you know, I was sort of part of that group and I, it got to be my favorite uh, activity out there. Cause I think you saw half at his most relaxed and the joking and the kidding and giving each other trouble yeah. and uh, you know, the movie talk. And, um, you know, just among the guys, right. uh, really, you saw a side of him that didn't come out in public all that frequently. Give us an idea of the men that were there. Well, there was his brother, Keith. Well, I should also tell you, typical for half, there was a seating arrangement. Okay. As I quickly learned, because I sat in the wrong seat. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Uh-oh. Get up. <laughs> uh, that's right. Who are you? Um, <laughs> Yeah, his brother Keith sat on one side of him, and Ray Anthony, uh, Mm -hmm. the old uh, uh, trumpet player, big band leader who known uh, half for years, was on one on the other side. And then um, there was an assortment of uh, movie historians. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard Mm Ban, I don't know if you know Richard. Yeah, he's actually going to come on the show in a couple weeks, so he's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah, Richard usually sat right next to uh, to Keith, and then a guy named Ron Borscht, who was a film historian, and then uh, Mark Cantor, another film and music historian, and then there was an assortment of actors, uh, like Robert Culp, uh, for example, was there until his death, um, and some movie directors uh, who were there, and various entertainers who were friends of Hef's, uh, people like Johnny Crawford, for example, from mm-hmm. the Disney studio, wow. and then little old me, I was sort of squeezed in there somewhere uh, as well. So really interesting people in, uh, in the film world, in the entertainment world. Did you um, did you directly interview any of the? I know you interviewed Keith, and I want to talk about that. But did you get an opportunity to interview the other men? Yeah, I did. Um, I interviewed uh, Richard Ban. Uh, I interviewed uh, uh, Dick Stewart. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dick and his wife Annie were old old friends of Hefts, and I interviewed Dick and Annie at some point. Uh, I think I interviewed Ray. Uh, Ray Anthony as well. And the other guys, I just talked to a lot, and uh, sort of informal conversations, right. but I, I I learned a lot. And typically, I would go to Manly Night, have dinner, see the movie, have a good time. And then I'd go back to my room and make notes mm, <laughs> uh, about the conversations I'd had to sort of, you know, keep my memory fresh as to what I'd learned. Mm. So formal and informal interviews, both. Now, uh, tell us about um, Keith, because that was that was really um, important uh, because he really gave you, you know, an, an understanding of, of Hef's formative years. And that is very important when understanding who Hugh Hefner was. Right. Yeah, Keith Hefner was a great guy. Um, I was really grew very fond of Keith. Um, I'm a tennis player, so they quickly sort of drafted me into the weekend tennis games that happened out there on the court. So I got to play tennis a lot, and Keith was often my partner. So, uh, yeah, I got to know Keith fairly well. And as uh, the book moved along, I actually sat down for a a formal interview with Keith. And um, 
Keith was very articulate. Uh, he was very fond of his brother. He was um, someone who himself played a role in the Playboy, uh, uh, the development of the Playboy Enterprise. He was, um, I think, sort of the key manager of the Playboy clubs when they emerged in yeah. the early 1960s. And so I talked to, he- uh, to Keith a lot about that, but then I also got him to go back and talk a lot about um, their childhood together because Keith was really the only one still alive yeah. uh, who knew that. So he talked to me about um, Hef as a kid and what he was like, what their family was like, what their household was like, uh, what their mother and father uh, were like, uh, the sort of nature of the family interactions uh, that they had as kids, uh, all that kind of thing. And, it, you know, it was very, uh, was quite invaluable, actually. Uh, sure. That kind of info right from uh, the horse's mouth. So uh, a very valuable interview. Now, did Keith, was he responsible for the training of the bunnies? Did you tell me that? Or was he more? Yes. Of the, okay. Yeah. Yes. I think when the Playboy Club idea uh, came to fruition in the early 60s, uh, I think, um, Hef turned to his brother as sort of the training supervisor, as I understand it, for the uh, bunny hostesses at the clubs. And Keith and some people he worked with were responsible for putting together, I think they called it the bunny handbook, which was sort of. Uh, you have that? Did he procedures. teach him the bunny dip? <laughs> that was the bunny. Well, was, I was going to say, I think that was his big achievement there. Was <laughs> was it really? The that's great. Dip. Will you pull out that bunny yeah, manual? That's so, that's so I so actually uh, brought the bunny manual. I'd oh, found a copy online and I brought it today for oh, Carrie no. to look at for our next upcoming interviews. And yeah, the Playboy Cub yeah. bunny manual. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was Keith's invention because they it's were looking so neat. for something a little different and that kind of backwards thing where they would lean over the table kind of backwards. <laughs> right. Uh, the, the thing of uh, drinks on on the table, that kind of thing. I mean, it's, certain, it's a little weird, but also sort of elegant, actually, in yeah. its own way. But uh, yeah. Yeah, there's, Great. there's graceful. Yeah, graceful. There's copious yeah. details in here that the bunnies yeah. would have to follow. And just going through it yeah. was like, wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. I went to yeah, a bunny club in uh, a Playboy club in New York just oh, a you few did? years oh. back. Yeah, I went with Pia. And I, I because none had existed That's for right. so long and then it was really fun we had a bet. great time I bet. and of course the girls who were working there um all were enamored with meeting the actual playmates, playmates. Yeah. yeah which yeah. i didn't see coming because right. i was thinking the same thing about them like oh, you guys are like real bunnies yeah and, and for our audience um you know some people know this but some people don't you know the bunnies were different than a playmate playboy playmate you were a centerfold the bunnies you were the club and to me each uh each right. position was equally uh coveted and important so i always like to point that out right. very right. interesting um steven i have a I have a question um being that you have a family and am i right that you have a daughter or daughters i uh, yes i have a daughter who how old she's 17 now you okay. are okay Perfect. so then my question would be knowing <laughs> what you know now if your daughter had uh, been accepted to be a playboy centerfold would you have supported that good question oh man That's a tough <laughs> question. guys trying to put me on the spot here. yeah um well um to be completely honest, I would, I think I might have kind of mixed feelings about it um, because I think the whole issue of nudity and, and your daughter and all that kind of thing sure. and, you know, being a father and all of that, uh, I, I would probably have mixed feelings. But I'm pretty sure that should such a thing happen, you know, I've tried to teach my daughter to be um, – her own person and her own woman and to be intelligent and make her own decisions. And, um, you know, if they're decisions that are done for good reasons that, uh, you know, even if I did have mixed feelings, I would back her in those decisions. So I think it would probably sort of leave it up to her. And if that's what she wanted to do and had a good reason for doing it, I, I would probably get in line and, you know, uh, support her. 
Yeah. It's a, well, that's it's a, a good, good question. dad answer. Yeah. yeah. I like that. And I think yeah. that's probably a normal answer. Most yeah. fathers, I mean, my father was mortified <laughs> until it came out. <laughs> my my like, dad threw a party. <laughs> <laughs> Your dad threw a party. I love it. <laughs> That's you know, I awesome. Talk to a lot of the playmates, and I, I would often ask that kind of thing about what your life, how your family reacted, and just like you guys, there was a wide variety of uh, reactions from moms and dads and families and alike. So, yeah, definitely. So, do you find that there are some common traits between um, a lot of the biographies that you've written on with? these very successful and groundbreaking men? Mm, good question. Yeah, what they have in common. That is yeah. a good question. Well, I've written uh, biographies of uh, Henry Ford and Walt Disney and Dale Carnegie, among others. And um, I think what they all have in common are really a couple of things. Um, one is that and I'm speaking here as a historian, so I sort of think historically, is I think they were the right people that had the right idea at the right time. Yeah. Um, they had something that appealed to something going on in the culture or the society that the culture or the society was ready for in some way. And I think a kind of special kind of intelligence perhaps at work that allowed them to come up with that, uh, that right idea at the right time. But the other thing I think which makes them different from me and I expect you and just about everybody I know is that the Fords and the Disneys and the Hefners of the world were ready to gamble everything mm -hmm. they had on their idea. Absolutely. Because every one of them, Every, yeah, every one of them in their own way. When they were first getting their venture off the ground, put up what they had to raise money. They borrowed money. Uh, they went into debt. <laughs> they, you know, put their life, um, their physical comfort, their regular life at risk in order to gamble it on this idea they were 100% committed to. And I think that's a quality that very few of us have, actually. Sure. Uh, to have the, so I think those are the two things that I would point to. And it's so, always interesting to me, uh, the factoid of history, that Ultimately, when they published the first issue of Playboy, they didn't think it was going to like go. <laughs> yeah, like, they that's didn't, why he didn't number it. Yeah, exactly. There was no volume number. I love that. And it flew off the shelves. Exactly. Yeah. And so. Yeah. And Heffitt. You know, he borrowed money from everybody he right. could in his family. And I think he hocked some furniture. And yeah. I mean, he went into debt and he did it all at a card table in his kitchen. Right. And just put everything out there. So, yeah. Yeah, it's really fascinating history about just the whole, you know, beginning of how it came to be and just the evolution and just always going against the grain at, at whatever cost. He knew there would be backlash. I mean, Indeed. when they started, I mean, there was, there was, um, I actually just found the FBI files between J. Edgar Hoover and Playboy and Huff, and that went on for years and years. Oh. Yeah, Hefner got in big trouble fairly quickly with, well, actually, the Postal Service was the right. first one, if I'm remembering correctly, because there was a big dust-up about sending pornographic material through the mail. Through the mail. Yeah. They had to have a lawsuit and legal stuff, and and then the FBI later on. <laughs> and, yeah, lots of problems there. So. Yeah, but <laughs> he said whatever, still keep <laughs> trudging that. ahead. I'm yeah. sure That's that right. kind of fed him in a way as well, because he stood his ground and ultimately everybody embraced, not yeah. everybody, a lot of people embraced what yeah. he was trying to do. Society as a whole. I mean, he changed so many things for our world and for society as a whole. And it's just really interesting to, to again, just be doing the research and conducting these interviews and we just learn so much. So much. Well, and Hef, we should remember also, was a very shrewd operator. Yeah, um, I think what he also understood is that controversy was his friend mm -hmm. and that controversy and dust ups with the government and um, all of these sorts of things got headlines and uh, the kind of venture he was involved in with Playboy, it was the kind of publicity that, you know, in a way you can't 
by. Right. So I think he understood very well that that kind of thing not only pushed him onward for sort of intellectual reasons, but also for publicity reasons that it was very good for what he was trying to do. Keeping mm-hmm. your name current. Keeping your name current. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, during the during your research, I'm, I'm sure you did, um, and and again, this is something that we're um, taking a deep dive into during this season is Hef's philanthropic endeavors, which were vast and many. Was that right. surprising to you? Did that kind of make sense that that would go hand in hand with with Hef and who he was? Well, it was a little surprising just because I didn't know much about all of that, and um, I guess what I learned a lot about with Hef. Um, was as I got to knew, know him, uh, he was a very, I, I think, kind would be the word yeah. that comes to mind and very solicitous of other people, actually. And, you know, he's got had this reputation of being this sort of, I think, out there among most people, this sort of, uh, you know, playboy, sex, 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 that's all the mansion and mm-hmm. the magazine are all mm-hmm. about. And, you know, not that Hef didn't enjoy that kind of thing, but uh, he also had a very kind uh, sort of human side to the guy that I came to appreciate. And um, I think his love of the movies is something Mm. that I had known nothing about and came to learn about. And once I learned about that and then learned about the millions of dollars he contributed to uh, various movie-related projects, uh, like saving old movies that were about Mm. to disintegrate and giving money of one kind or another to movie preservation groups and the Hollywood sign and the like, uh, all of that kind of made sense to me after I got to know the guy. Mm. Very good. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Uh, Well, this is maybe a little off book, but um, because of your background and studies, what do you think about the term of toxic masculinity? Oh, I like that. Oh, I think it's a kind of silly idea myself. Um, You know, it's something that gets tossed around a lot and, um, I don't think it's a very precise term for one thing, and I also think that it's gotten so incredibly wrapped up with, you know, for one of a better term, political correctness that it describes not only men who do bad things, you know, such as physically, you know, manhandle women or, you know, uh, do violent physical things but it's also become a kind of catch-all term for men who are just as i guess i would put it are just sort of old-fashioned men uh who um you know are quiet they're the kind of gary cooper Mm -hmm. types i guess in that um you know if you're not sort of exuding sensitivity out of every pore of your body that uh, you're suffering from toxic masculinity and that's kind of where i get off the boat Uh, i I think it's just become a term to describe so much that it doesn't describe very much at all right kind of like everybody's a narcissist now oh yeah (laughs) exactly (laughs) if you're thinking about yourself at all then you must be a narcissist (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's funny wow that's that's fascinating i love this so, Stephen, we like to end the show with two questions we ask everybody. Um, okay. First question, three words that define Hef to you. Um, intelligent, committed, and control. Ah. I think he liked to control every like aspect of his life. Yeah. Those are the three I'd pick off the top of my head. It's interesting because everybody always has um, different ones, uh, what they say. So that's a first on those. So thank you. Um, Okay. Second question. Had you had the chance to speak to Hef before he passed or in memoriam, what would you say? Well, pretty much what I said to Hef the last time we had a communication. I went out to the mansion a lot, actually, from 05 till about. Uh, 2016. Oh, nice. Because I did, I did some History Channel things about Playboy and some interviews, and I would be in LA for other things, and we had kind of got to be friends. So yeah. I, I was always welcome at the mansion, and I think the last time I saw Hef was about a year before he died, 
and we had a conversation. He was not looking too good, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. But um, when I got home, I wrote him a little letter, and um, I said, you know, it was a great pleasure to see you once again, and I just want to let you know that um, it was a great pleasure for me to be able to do that book and to talk to you and learn about your life and I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate you cooperating and led me into your life uh, in the way that you did, because it's one of the most interesting chapters of my life uh, as well. So thank you very much. And he wrote back to me and said, well, you're welcome. And I never regretted for a minute the decision I made. Oh, that's so kind. That's so sweet. That has to feel great. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we keep Indeed. all those letters or any sort of personal yes, stuff from Hefner. Well, I'm I so glad those. that you interviewed him and did this biography because yeah. then Hef lives on. Yeah. It's Absolutely. really important to us. Thank you so much, Stephen. We've enjoyed this. What an awesome interview. Well, thank you. It's been uh, really a delight to talk to you ladies and yeah. uh, best of luck with your other interviews. Okay. Thank we'll you talk so soon. much. All right. Bye, Have Steven. a good one, Stephen. That was awesome. Love it. Wow. Okay. So for our audience and our listeners, um, thank you for your support. Thank you for your unwavering interest in um, the show, but specifically Hefner. Um, Don't forget to follow us. Uh, We have our YouTube channel, The Bunny Chronicles, and we have all the videos up there of all of our interviews. Um, Obviously, Instagram at TBC Vodcast, as in The Bunny Chronicles Vodcast. And we're going to do a shout out now to our listeners around the world. So I'm going to go to a city here. We're going to spin the screen. (laughs) We've got this touch top top screen. So we're going to spin the screen. Okay. To our 27 listeners in Stony Creek, Ontario, thank you for following us. Um, Feel free to share the show with your friends, your colleagues. We appreciate you all. Now, Carrie's going to call out somebody out in the big world of ours. All right, Miss Carrie. All right. Malaysia. Malaysia. Thank you for our listener in Malaysia. Is it a single listener? It is. Our sole so you listener. you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get those numbers up in Malaysia, but we thank you, number one. Where are your friends? <laughs> Have a party. <laughs> exactly. Awesome, awesome. Okay, we will uh, see you next week. I'm Echo. I'm Carrie. And this is The Bunny Chronicles. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.